wanted to continue with what I uh, was doing last time, but I decided I have two digressions, and I thought I would do the digressions first, because one should always have fun first and then work. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't have to ask for a talk. There's no need. So that's a good rule in life. If you have a job and you have fun, you should have the fun first, because if there's no time for both, you wouldn't want to miss that part. OK, so I'll start with the digressions. They're a little bit related to each other. So one was about orthogonal polynomials. And I saw from the reactions of people, I actually asked people to raise their hand if they feel reasonably familiar with orthogonal polynomials, like they know basic definitions and a few examples. And almost no hands went up. So maybe people are shy, but maybe many people don't know. And as Gelfand told, his, uh, you know, the young mathematician who was teaching a 16-year-old mathematics, you haven't taught him orthogonal polynomials, he's already 16. Everybody should know orthogonal polynomials. So I don't apologize for making a digression, but the, I'll tell you in a second what they are. So if you have some measure, you get a sequence of orthogonal polynomials, which are unique if you make it, make it monic polynomials. And the, the Bernoulli polynomials are Certainly, monic polynomials of each, you know, for each n, you have a unique polynomial, the n of x, which starts x to the n. And if you have orthogonal polynomials, you also have one of each degree, and you typically normalize to be monic. And so the question is, are, are the Bernoulli numbers orthogonal uh, for some measure? So I answered last time that I've thought about something. Ah, I've thought about something related once, but I couldn't remember what. I would look at my notes. I had a feeling the answer would be no. And indeed, the answer is no. And the proof is very short of that. But uh, first of all, the proof uses wonderful properties of orthogonal polynomials, which, as Gelfand said, everybody should know. And actually, there are three of them. Uh, I wrote this up in a paper, well, I mean, we in a paper with Kaneko. I think 1997, where we, so it's also my, my homepage if you want to look at more details of the paper. The proposition is three parts. One is quite well known, one is less known, most people don't know it, and one I think was new, at least I've never seen it in the literature. So I will give all three here, because then you'll, even if you happen to be an expert on orthogonal polynomials, of which we definitely have at least one in the room, then you'll probably learn something, because as far as I know, that last property is not known. But this, the, the simplest property of orthogonal polynomials already is not satisfied by the Bernoulli numbers, and so that answers the question. There's no measure. However, what would it mean for them to be orthogonal? It would mean that for some measure that you would have Bn, let's call it R and S because I have too many Ns and Ms later in sums, it would say that for some measure on the real line, so, you know, some w of x dx, or if you want a fancier notation, some you know, du of x, uh, some measure on the real line that this would be zero for r different from s. But if you think about it, there's only one reasonable measure for Bernoulli polynomials. They're really made to be periodic. I mean, they're, they're made to be, because b, b of x plus 1 is almost the same as b of x. And therefore, they're really on the circle, and there's only one possible measure on the circle. It's the the Beck measure, because it has to be invariant. You know, the higher measure, it's, it's, it's a group. It has to be invariant. And the circle would, therefore, the only reasonable question would be this. So one could ask whether this is zero. It certainly isn't. That, of course, you could just check an example. As I said, I'll show you in a second that they aren't orthogonal for any measure. So this is not true. But you can ask, what is it? And it turns out that that has a very, very pretty answer. And that very pretty answer has a pretty application which is not a well-known theorem. In fact, that's also in a paper of mine, an appendix to a book, like so many appendices I write, a book by three Japanese people, all of whom were friends of mine, well, one died just as the book came out, on Bernoulli numbers, and I wrote a long ap appendix, and I discovered several things, one of which, I'll tell you, that's the prettiest, had actually been known since 1923 by Nielsen, but I only found that out afterwards, but there were a couple of related things that were quite fun that I won't talk. So I'll, I'll make a digression on orthogonal polynomials and also a little bit about Bernoulli polynomials, even though they're not orthogonal. So let me say what orthogonal 
polynomials, say, so first of all, if you have any vector space and you have some scalar product, so let's say, so V is a vector space, a vector space means you have a field, which to me will certainly be characteristic zero, and V is a vector space, okay, maybe infinite dimensional, and you have some scalar product, so given any two vectors, uh, you know, V and W in this vector space, you have a scalar product, a number, then you can try to make an orthogonal basis. So a basis of things which are mutually orthogonal. And so the case I'm going to take care about is, first of all, this vector space is not any old vector space. It's the space of polynomials in one variable with coefficients in K. But this phi is not anything. So to give this, uh, I'm writing a round bracket, x m x n could a priori be g m n, and the only condition really for it to be the scalar product, I mean, you extend by linearity, so it's automatically bilinear and it should be symmetric, maybe anti-symmetric, but let's think of it all as real. Uh, then I would just have a collection of numbers which are arbitrary. And then you could try to make then orthogonal polynomials, which might or might not exist in the general case. It would be Pn of x is, uh, let's say we normalize, because if you rescale everything, it won't change. And I want a basis, so I need something in every degree. So let Pn of x be something of degree n, and with the property that Pm and Pn are orthogonal for the scalar product if m is different from n. That's what I would mean for any orthogonal base, and especially for polynomials. But if it's an arbitrary vector space, you won't get that. But let's assume, uh, so I can first say it in a fancy language, well, first very fancy. So phi is an element of V dual, or V star, depending how old-fashioned you are which means that phi is a linear map from V, a K linear map from V into K. And then Gn is simply phi of x to the n. That's just a fancy way of writing it, because of course any linear map on the polynomials is uniquely determined by its values on monomials, and so it's equivalent to give a sequence of numbers. So whether I do the one or the other. But now assume, let's assume that this thing so I want that the scalar product of Gn with 1 is going to be this phi, uh, this Gn. But I want more generally that the scalar product here only depends on the sum n plus n. Well, that's a really stupid way of saying what I really want to say, which is that the, if I have two polynomials, then their scalar product only depends on their product. You multiply them, and then you apply some functional. So that's a special kind of scalar product which factors through the product. So you have the map, uh, I mean V, well, you have this. Uh, right, there's a map multiplication, V tensor V, uh, just multiplication to V, and the scalar product is on this will actually sim two because it's symmetric and it should factor through. Now the classical example, as I said, is when K is either the reals or maybe a subfield of the real numbers, so often it's the rational numbers, and your uh, F and G, is defined, as I just wrote before, it's the integral over the real numbers, since k is containing the real numbers, f of x, g of x, and then some w of x dx, where this is a positive, uh, let's say even a strictly positive function. So that, or no, sorry, greater than or equal, because it might have compact support, but it's positive somewhere. So that's the, you know, and all of the famous examples in the literature Hermit and Laguerre and Chebyshev and Gegenbauer and Jacobi and all of those polynomials are certainly, there's some appropriate measure, usually compactly supported, maybe from minus one to one if it's the Gegenbauer polynomials or whatever it is. But we don't have to have that. Okay, so how would you find these polynomials? Well, of course, it's clear you use Graham, Graham Schmidt. So you start, you have the basis one x squared x cubed. P zero has to be uh, one, because it's monic and it starts with one. This is x minus a plus a constant, but then the scalar product of x plus a constant with one is p1, p0. And since one is different from zero, that should be zero. So that means, uh, but c with one is the scalar product uh, of one with one, which is the number I call g0, and x with one is the number I call g1. So you see that c is now uniquely determined, g0 over uh, sorry, G1 over G0. And in particular, you see that the first condition is that G0 shouldn't be 0. But G0 is the scalar product of 1 with itself. So in the most typical case, 
And in particular here, FF in here is always strictly positive because this is a square. And therefore, that's automatic. So then it'll automatically be non-degenerate. In general, if you take a random collection of GNs, it's almost always non-degenerate. But if you do it badly, and you'll see the condition in a couple of minutes, the precise condition on a sequence, let's say K is Q, and I have a collection of numbers GN, what is the exact condition that the system is non-degenerate in order that we can find these PNs? And you see the very first condition is already that G0 is non-zero. OK? Uh, but then you continue. And of course, the process is very well known. And you all know it. It's called Gram-Schmidt normalization. So it's just basically in your algebra that has nothing to do with polynomials. So you take xn, and then you subtract a polynomial of lower degree, because after all, it's got to be, uh, it has to be monic, and x the n is monic. But by induction, the pms for m less than n, you already know what they are, and they are monic of degree m. And so this is certainly something. And so there is some coefficient here with this. But to find the coefficient, you just take the scalar product of pm with this thing. Well, the scalar product of pm with p m prime is 0, and thus m equals m prime. So I'll only pick out one term. And here I'll have the scalar product of x to the n with pm. And here I'll have the scalar product of pm with pm, which so certainly one of the conditions I might need is that, PM, you know, that ff is never 0. But I'm not sure I actually need that. OK, so this is the formula, the inductive formula. So you can go to your computer if you know the GMs. And then, of course, you know the co coefficients of each previous PM. And then you just a combination of the GI. But we want to see how these things actually look. And so it's, uh, it's very nice. And so, so generically, this exists. Or in the case of real polynomials, it certainly exists. So the proposition I want to tell you, it is four parts. The first one is very well known. The first two are certainly uh, well known and easy. The second is also known, but it's not that well known. It's something everyone should know. And the fourth is a slight improvement on that, well, for the corollary, which, uh, as I say, kind of and I found that we don't even know if it's in the literature. So the claim is that there exist numbers a n and b n in, in the field. So given such a sequence, so we have these GNs. So the GNs will uniquely define a collection of numbers a, n, and b, n. And, I'll, and the last parts will tell you exactly how to get a, n, and b, n, uh, such that you have the following inductive formula. To get, well, let's assume you know those numbers. So somebody gives you some numbers a, n, and b, n, but not all numbers will necessarily work. Then you define p, n plus 1. Well, we already know p, n of x. But that's monic of degree n. It starts with x to the n. We want x to the n plus 1, so I better multiply. But now there's a constant, x plus a n. The way I wrote it is x minus, I should follow my notes so that I don't get the numbering mixed up. And the claim is that the induction always is a very, very simple form. PM is, of course, some kind of a combination of its, all the predecessors, but it's just x plus a constant times the previous polynomial plus another constant times the pre-previous polynomial, and none of the others enter at all. So it's a three-term recursion, which, by the way, if you talk about recursions, this is length two. The three-term recursion is length two. So in the, it, 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 recursion of length d is you replace n, n plus 1, or n minus 1, with n minus d. That's the key invariant. It's like the order of a differential equation. So this is a second order thing. And this already tells you, if you're used at all to continued fractions, anything, any sequence of numbers at all, which satisfies the three-term recursion. So the n plus first is a combination of the nth and the n minus first with some coefficients, like Fibonacci numbers. Such a thing always is related to a continued fraction. So the second-order recursion is almost the same as saying that there's a relation, and I'll write it as the rest of the later in the proposition, with continued fractions. So that's the first statement. Actually, that's so easy. Why don't I prove that before I write the other parts? So we assume that these PNs exist, OK? And uh, as I say, for ge uh, generically, they will exist. So then if I just multiply, uh, I won't, well, I can put the x each time. It's not that much work. If I multiply PN of x by x, I've just found PN of x. I want to find the next one. Well, this one starts with x to the n plus 1. So if I expand it, I can certainly expand it as a combination of all 
all orth my orthogonal basis because it's a basis, and the first coefficient is one because it's so this is one because it's monic. Now the next coefficient is a n. Maybe I'll drop all the x's. These are just numbers, p n minus one plus c n p n minus two plus d n p n minus three, etc. Right? Just by the definition. I mean it's a basis, so I can write it as a basis. And what I'm claiming is exactly that C and DN and all the others are zero, because that's exactly the recursion I wrote, and that's the reason for the minus signs, X minus AN, PN. So let's do DN as an example. Well, if I multiply DN by PN minus 3, PN minus 3, and remember, I'm kind of assuming that the scalar product of something with itself is never zero. In the classical case, it's strictly positive, so it's definitely not zero. Then that will be the same as the, as the scalar product of PN minus 3 with the right-hand side. Because if I take Pn minus 3 and take its scalar product, with it's, it's orthogonal to every the Pn, including you know, the next Pn minus 4. They're all orthogonal, except with itself, because that's what it means to have an orthogonal basis. But the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side. Uh, so this is now left-hand side. But the left-hand side is x times Pn. But remember, my basis only dependent on the product of the two polynomials. The product of Pn minus 3 with xpn is the same as the product of x times Pn minus 3 with Pn. But now I'm done. That's certainly 0 because xpn minus 3 is degree at most n minus 2. And so it's a combination of earlier polynomials which are orthogonal to this one. So end of proof. And you see why it fails. It, it works perfectly well for n minus 2. But it doesn't work for n minus 1 because xpn minus 1 pn is non-zero. So in fact, we actually get more, because by that same argument, if I do the same thing, not with n minus 3, but with n minus 1, this number is non-zero again, because I'm assuming the scalar products with themselves are never zero. So bn times pn minus 1, if I, that, that's we assume is known. I mean, the scalar product is given, and we've already found pn minus 1. Then bn times this, by exactly the same argument, will be the scalar product of x pn minus 1 with pn. But xpn minus 1 by the same recursion, it starts pn plus lower polynomials. And those lower polynomials are orthogonal to this because they're orthogonal. So this is simply pn, pn. So I've now not only proved the first part of the theorem, I've proved the second part, which I hadn't even yet written, which is that pn is the ratio pn, pn divided by pn minus 1, pn minus 1. So the first part tells you exactly how to get the function recursively but not really exactly because there are two unknown sequences, a n and b n. But now at least I've told you half of them. I've told you what b n is. Now, this is enough. So here's an important remark. This is not enough for the general case because we have two sequence of numbers. And I've only told you the b n's, not the a n's. But in all of the classical case that I listed by memory, just what I could think of, Amit, uh, Laguerre, uh, Chebyshev, uh, Jacobi, uh, there are so many, uh, Chebyshev of the first and second kind, Gegenbauer, and so on. All of those have the following property. They have a well-defined parity. So in the space of polynomials, there's an involution. X goes to minus X. The even part is the even polynomials. The odd is the odd. And all of these typically have the property that they're even polynomials, which means, uh, well, in, in this case, we mean the GN are zero if N is odd. So therefore, two things of different parities are automatically orthogonal. But in that case, we're done. Because if n is, let's say, even, then this is an odd polynomial. This is an odd polynomial. This is an even polynomial. So this has to be odd, which means a n has to be 0. So if p n of minus x is equal to minus 1 to the n p n of x, so if that's true, which implies it's simply equivalent to saying that the, these numbers that determine my scalar product uh, that the only ones that are non-zero are the even index ones, and this is very, very common, then uh, trivially a n is zero. And so I don't owe you a second coefficient because I've told you b n. Well, I haven't really, really, really told you b n because let's say you want b 1,000. Well, then you have to compute p1, p2, all the way up to b 1,000 by this recursion, and then you can compute the scalar product p1,000. So I'd like to give you the n's and the n's directly in terms of the original numbers, and that's what I'll do in the fourth part, which is the part that we haven't seen. But the third part is actually the most interesting, and this clearly shows. So define, 
well, I can make the definition outside. Let phi of x be the power series g0, which remembers the scalar product of 1 with itself, then g1, which is the scalar product of 1 with x, then g2, which is the scalar product of 1 with x squared, uh, and, and so on. So let me make a power series in 1 over x, 1 over capital X. So I'll use little x for a small variable for now and big x for a big variable, in fact, for 1 over little x. So let's make that power series. So now define a second sequence of polynomials Uh, Qn of x by the same recursion. So that's what you always do with continued fractions. You have two different solutions of the same recursion. If it's a two-term, uh, three-term recursion, meaning they have two, then you can pick the first two ar numbers arbitrarily. So for instance, 0, 1, and 1, 0, or something else. And then that gives a basis. So we always want two solutions if it's second order. If it were the 10th order, I would want 10 solutions. So I pick a second, but I have to give initial conditions. So here, uh, so it's the recursion 1, so exactly the same qn plus 1 is x minus an qn minus bn qn minus 1 with the same ans and bns. But with the initial conditions, well, I can already tell you now the degree of pn we already know is supposed to be n. I want that the second series, and you'll see in a moment that it's crucial that I have that, has to be n minus 1. And therefore, the 0 of 1 has negative degree, and by convention, or, well, actually, not by convention, by definition, a polynomial of negative degree has no coefficient, so it's 0. So for that, I have no choice. So q0 of x is the 0 polynomial, and q1 of x should have degree 0, so it's a constant. I'm going to choose g0, which in the other notation of my functional is phi of 1. Okay? Then, so that's a long definition. Then, this statement, I want to get the error term right, so I better check, check my notes. I don't get it wrong. Then if I divide qn of x by pn of x, so I should have used capital X as the, actually, I have been using capital X as the variable, then this is what's called the Padé approximation, which means I have this power series 5x, and I try to approximate it as accurate as I can with rational functions of a given degree which means numerator and denominator have degree at most n, for some n. Well, since it starts with 1 over x, if the denominator is at most n, the numerator is at most n minus 1. And so that'll be this. And just by counting the number of constants you have, you see that if I try to approximate phi as well as possible, this has degree n. I don't yet know what it is. So there are n plus 1 coefficients, but actually only n, because I can multiply both these by constant. I've normalized. It starts with 1. So although it's nth degree, there are n free coefficients. And q has degree n minus 1, but I don't know any of them. So it's two n coefficients. And so I can achieve, or the best I can hope to achieve, is 2n minus 1. And I can. And these are the polynomials that do it. And there's a standard algorithm to, to find that, which, which is, in fact, boils down in a second to this recursion. So the pn and the qn are that. And for people who know Padé approximations, they already know that that means there's a continued fraction. But now 4 I have to put somewhere else because I've run out of space. So here now is, and this is very pretty, uh, how you find the ans and the bns directly out of the gns without computing all the polynomials in a row. So part 4, and it got too low. Part 4 says, if I take the power series the same generating function of the gns, but now with little x, which you can think of as 1 over big x, but I don't put in the factor 1 over capital X. I just take the same thing. Well, this is a power series. So I can develop it in a continued fraction if nothing goes wrong. So it starts g0 because I mean, it has to start g0. And now I put 1 minus lambda 1x over 1 minus lambda 2x over 1 minus lambda 3x over, well, dot, dot, dot. So you can't always do that. You might find at some point that the next coefficient would have to be infinite or something. I mean, you could get into trouble. And the condition that this works is exactly the non-degeneracy condition. But for generic coefficients, it will certainly work. So I developed the power series, the generating function of the GNs, 
there are two standard kinds of generating functions, some a n x to the n, some a n over n factorial x to the n. But a third kind of generating function is a continued fraction. It's completely different. You, there's an equivalence between a power, let's say it starts with 1, the power series starting with 1, and a sequence of coefficients. And it's a different way of, co of making an isomorphism between sequence of coefficients and numbers. And so if I go from the GNs as the coefficients of the additive generating function to the lambda n's, which are the coefficients of the thing, then I get some numbers. Then the formulas, I can't remember which is plus and which is minus uh, GN. Well, it'll be a corollary. Then, first of all, lambda i is non-zero for all i. That's the non-degeneracy condition. So if you take generic g, of course, why should they be zero? But if one is zero, there, it won't work, and there won't be orthogonal polynomials. And the reason is very simple. These numbers bn, you can get if you multiply two adjacent lambda n's, but in the order, any two adjacent numbers, one is even and one is odd. If the odd one comes first, so lambda 2n minus 1 times lambda n, I claim that is bn. But we already saw that bn is a quotient of scalar products. And so if the scalar product is never 0, as it better not be, then if it's a basis, then indeed uh, this can't be 0. That's the first statement. And the an, it's really very pretty. You do exactly the same. You take two adjacent ones. Adjacent numbers, one is even and one is odd. So if the, if the smaller one is odd, you multiply them. And if the smaller index is even, you add them. So the sum of the lambdas of index 2n and 2n plus 1, that gives you the a. It's very cute. That I won't prove because we don't need it for anything. And I actually don't know any important application of this. As I said, in the interesting cases, the um, ans are simply 0. And, and, and therefore, the lambdas are just alternating. And, it's kind of, and, and you can rewrite the whole thing with x squared as a continued fraction with x over 1 minus mu 1 x squared and so on. So it's sort of boring. But, uh, but in the general case, it's, I find this very pretty that you take the generating function of the numbers that determine your scalar product, you expand them at a continued fraction, and then this, uh, you either take the product of two of them or the sum of two of them, and those are the, the x's that you need. OK, so uh, that's the general proposition. Now, to prove this, uh, I just you know, switched on the computer. If I take b12 of x, x b11 of x, b11 of x, and b10 of x, those are polynomials, all of them degree at most 12. So there are 13 coefficients, there are four polynomials. I computed in the split second in Paris that 4 by 13 matrix, and its rank was 4. So there is no linearly dependent. These are linearly independent. You just check it. I could have taken any other number. And therefore, there is no such recursion for any ANs and BNs. It's simply not true that x times b11 is a combination of b12 and should be. OK, so, so therefore, they're not orthogonal polynomials in that usual sense. But I took advantage of that question to, because it's such a fun thing. And as Gelfon said, everyone should know orthogonal polynomials. And I think the fact that there's this connection with continued fractions, even if you don't remember this theorem, but this Padé is essentially the same thing. That's something that one should be aware of. And you know, if you ever need it, at least then you know that you should look it up and remember how it worked. Sorry? Oh, no, not at all. It's just I like 12 because, you know, 691. No, no, I just, I just took B12. No, I'm sure it happens for every single N. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it happens already for B2. It would be, we can even do it for uh, B2, since I know them by heart. B2 is this. B1 is x minus a half. Oh, no, sorry, that's not going to work. That's too small because these polynomials all degree 2, and it's a three-dimensional space. So obviously, any four things are going to be linear. It depended, but if you take the next one, it won't work. No, it'll never work. Also, because these do, now the Bernoulli polynomials are not even or odd, but morally they're even or odd. Remember, I told you the most frequent situation, like Chebyshev of the first kind, second kind, the even index ones are even, the odd ones are odd. Bernoulli, you might say, hey, they're not even and odd. I mean, I just wrote down a couple. But, uh, but remember, the first three polynomials are x minus a half. Well, that looks like this through the point a half. It's certainly not odd, but it is an odd function around a half if you shift by half. And similarly, the next one, x squared minus x plus a sixth, is x minus a half squared plus a twelfth. 
So that's therefore an even function of x minus a half. And its graph indeed looks like this. It's symmetric around a half. And that's always true. And I wrote it last time. That's one of the very easy properties of Bernoulli polynomials that they had this reflection. And this exactly says it's even or odd around a half. So if I made that rather hard on the shift of just shifting x to x plus a half, then they would be even or odd. And then you even need, then I could probably even use n equals 2 to see that it doesn't work. This. OK, so, so those are not orthogonal. But then, as already said, the only natural measure for the Bernoulli polynomials is the higher measure on the circle. Because really, deep down, they're on the circle. It's true that, of course, they're not poly periodic. No polynomial is periodic. And you remember, and I'll use this in a second, that we define br of x to be br of the fractional part of x. So this is going to curly brackets. So this is the fractional part, x minus x, or the more modern notation that people like is this, the floor, because there's also the ceiling. And I use that too, but I kind of still like the Gaussian notation. So this is true for all r greater than or equal to 0 and for all x in r, except that b1 of x is 0 if x is an integer. Of course, it should be periodic. So when I say x could be 0, that's the same as x is an integer. And then you don't take b1 of the fractional part, which is b1 of 0, which is minus a half, because uh, I just drew the picture. Here's the polynomial. If you make it periodic, it jumps. It's a sawtooth function. And as you always do in Fourier analysis, so you take the, the middle value 0. So that's the definition of br of x. And so what I really want is the scalar product of br of x with bs bar of x. And now this is no longer on the real line. It's on r modulo z. And there, there's only one reasonable product that you could probably, I mean, scalar pro uh, measure you can think of. It has to be hard measured. It has to be compatible with the translation group. And, uh, and well, this thing won't be. So this bar is not context conjugation. It's this periodic thing. And here, it doesn't matter what I do at the endpoints. It's an integral. So we want to compute this thing. So the, the question is, what is this? And I'll just give the answer, but I'll sketch the proof in one line because it's also an important point, but then I'll give an application of that formula. So the formula is very nice. So I'll erase all this framing. So here's the formula. The scalar product of BR with BS, of, of course, it's an integral. It's a rational number because these are polynomials with rational coefficients. And what it is, it's slightly amusing because it looks, doesn't look symmetric in R and S, but of course, it better be symmetric. So it's the, it's a reciprocal. I hope I didn't know. So it's a reciprocal binomial coefficient, r factorial s factorial over r plus s factorial, multiplied by the Bernoulli number of index r plus s. So it's certainly not zero, but that's the formula. So remark, this is symmetric. That's obvious on the left, because it's just the integral, br times bs. It's not quite obvious here. This is symmetric. This is symmetric. But minus 1 to the r is not minus 1 to the s. But of course, it is minus 1 to the s, unless, uh, unless r and s have opposite parities. But if they have opposite parities, then r plus s is 0, uh, is 1, because that's the only odd index Bernoulli number which exists. So only for b. One, and but for B one this is false because if I take R to be one and S to be zero, I'm confused. If R is one and S is zero, then this integral is zero. So uh, so this must be uh, sorry. It's of course zero if r plus s is 1. And this if r plus s is different from 1. Because if r plus s is 1, since these are non-negative, one of them is 0 and 1 is 1, and the Bernoulli polynomial is average 0. But that's just a silly way of writing it, because it's also 0 automatically if r is different from s modulo 2, which is why the symmetry is back. And you see that now that's obvious on the right, because the Bernoulli numbers 
if r plus s is not 1, then there's 0 unless r plus s is even. But it's also true here for the reason I told you. If you look around the point a half rather than the point 0, then this is even if r is even and odd if r is odd, and similarly this. And so if they have opposite parities, you're integrating an odd function. The interval is, of course, 0. So that, that, that's the, I mean, that's just trivial comments, but, but my formula wasn't quite right because I forgot to say that you know, if r plus s is 1, you get 0. You get 0, yeah. That's a trivial case. OK, so let me tell you the proof of this. There's one I told you already last time that the br bar of x are very important because we use them in the euler maclaurin summation form by induction. We had an integral from 0 to 1 of Bernoulli, but then we have to shift the integer, the interval 0, 1 to 1, 2, 2, 3 to sum. And then I have to keep shifting the Bernoulli ba polynomial back to the origin. So I use br bar. So that was one motivation. So important for two reasons. Actually, three reasons. And now reason. First of all, it appears, they appear, so these are modified periodic Bernoulli, appear in the error term, which I did last time, of the euler maclaurin summation formula. Well, I'll just put it for euler summation. OK? But the other is this. If you have a function which is periodic, then it's got a Fourier expansion. And the Fourier expansion, assuming it converts, I'll assume r is not 0 because you know, b0 is just 1. So a Fourier expansion will always have the form, uh, so there's a constant, so I better leave a little space for the constant. Every Fourier expansion has the form e to the 2 pi i and x times a coefficient, a numerical coefficient. And of course, it should converge. And so the answer is, up to a constant, the coefficients are incredibly simple. It's simply 1 over n to the r. So the easiest sequence as functions of, of n here are the pure powers. These are much more complicated than pure powers. But these are simple. And this is br bar because it's periodic. And the coefficient is certainly there's a 2 pi i to the r. But what I can't remember, it's minus, minus r factorial over 2 pi i. That's why I used uh, r and s rather than i and j because I didn't want 2 pi i to the i. So 2 pi i to the r. OK, except, of course, you shouldn't divide by 0. So n is different from 0. Now, this includes Euler's famous proof, right, because eight of 2, uh, or more generally, if I take x to be 0, then this is, of course, 0 if r is odd, because the terms n to the r and minus n to the r cancel if r is odd. But if r is even, then so for r equals 0, we'll find that br of 0, which is simply br if r is even, will be minus 1 to the now r over 2 minus 1, r factorial over 2 pi to the r. And then this sum will be 2 times zeta of r, because x is 0. And so that's exactly Euler's formula for zeta of r. So this uh, and it's an absolutely standard calculation. There are a million proofs of it. One easy proof, I'll just do it in our heads, uh, for b1, well, there's a formula for any function, the, the nth coefficient you just integrate. And by integrating by parts and using the properties of the Bernoulli polynomials, you get this. But you can just do it for b1. And then remember, the derivative of any bn is a multiple of the previous one. But if I differentiate this in n, I just reduce r by 1. So both sides have the property that the derivative works. And then you just need one more uh, normalizing property. Anyway, there are many, many proofs. This is an exercise. So now this, you can, I hope, see in your, more or less in your head that this formula implies this proposition. Sorry, I can't hear you. And the, the audience is there, constant, is there a constant term in the in the Fourier series? No. And there's no constant. There. So no the constant integral there. of BR it should be zero then. Yes, that's certainly true, because remember yeah. that Bn prime is n times Bn minus one. But we also have that Bn of zero is equal to Bn of one as soon as n is at least two. But so then when you, you plug in, I'm, I'm answering your question. If I integrate a function uh, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral from, uh, of a derivative is the difference of the values at the endpoint. But bn is a derivative of bn plus 1, which has the same values at the endpoint. So yes, the average value of every Bernoulli polynomial except b0 is 0. So indeed, there's no constant term. It's How about in this formula when you plug s0 in the, in the formula that you wrote on the board? Which no. formula? I have yeah. many formulas. The integral of br against bs. If you put s0, 
B0 is just a constant, right? You should integrate BR. Then it should be the right-hand side. Then it should well, be Well, it zero. is. If S, I hope it is. S is 0. I mean, I just asked because something seemed... Uh, uh. Oh, sorry. I know. But that's what I was thinking in, my, in our paper. There isn't any special case that something panicked. Here, Some of course, nobody's interested in B0 times BS because indeed it's zero. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. This is true if R and S are positive. If R and S is zero, this is trivially zero, and I exclude it. And that's why the symmetry is OK, because if they're positive, then they have to have the same parity, because otherwise this would be three or bigger. So thank you very much. You, you cover it. And I knew I was making a mistake when I wrote that, but I couldn't, couldn't find it. Thanks. Wow. Not just knowledgeable, but paying a lot of attention. So yeah, I completely missed that. Thank you very much. That was an oversight. And indeed, the theorem was obviously not always true. But this is true, and I gave the reason the integral of Bn is 0 because it's the derivative of the next one, and the next one is the same values at the endpoints. So indeed, the integral from 0 to 1 vanishes. So now you could do it in your head. This integral, as I already said, since it's periodic, is the same, but now I don't have to go from 0 to 1. Physicists would do it anyway because they always break symmetries, but now we don't have to choose a fundamental domain from 0 to 1. It's simply the integral of this periodic function over the whole circle. But now if I expand br as up to a constant, e to the 2 pi i n x over n to the r, and the others e to the 2 pi i n x over m to the s. But when I integrate e to the 2 pi i n x against e to the 2 pi i m x, I only get something non-zero if n equals minus m. So therefore, I'll just pick up those terms, and it's 1 over n to the r plus s, which is z of r plus s. But it's odd. So if r plus s is odd, that's 0. But if r plus s is even, as I just reminded you, it's a Bernoulli number. And so if you work out the details, you get this formula. Uh, it's nice to know that because there's actually a fun formula, which is exactly the same proof, which says that if you take, now again, I can do it multiple r, and now I really want to because there's nothing special about zero and one. If I take the Bernoulli numbers br of x, but I shift. Now, obviously, if I shift both of them, by the same amount, alpha dx, then it's the same integral because higher measure it's invariant. So that means if I put, if I shift by alpha and beta, it can only depend on alpha and beta. I'm putting again the periodic. And indeed, it's the only form that could be. It's the periodic version of alpha minus beta. That's kind of pretty. And before alpha and beta were zero, and this was just a big norm. I mean, it's exactly the same proof. OK, so that's uh, kind of a fun property of Bernoulli numbers. And in particular, as I said, we already knew they weren't orthogonal because they don't satisfy three-term recursion. But now we know what the scalar products are. They aren't zero, but they are Renoui numbers. But now the last fun thing that, uh, as I said, was uh, discovered already by Nielsen in 1923. I didn't know it. It's not at all good. Let's assume that I've let, let I'll call it little pn so they don't look orthogonal, be polynomials of degree exactly n. So in particular, they form a basis for the space of polynomials, whether they're orthogonal, Bernoulli, or whatever they are. They form a basis. Then, so then v, uh, v, which remember was k of x, well, k for us will usually be q, is the direct sum, that's what I just said, of k times pn of x. So they form a basis. But this is, of course, a ring. It's an algebra. So it's a k algebra. It's a ring. So that means that I can multiply. P, now I can go back to i and j because I don't have any i's. So I can take pi times pj, and it's got to be a combination of pk's. So you can do this in any ring with the basis, and you get numbers, cijk. So here k, greater than or equal to 0. But of course, because this is degree i and this is degree j, then here k, it's going to be a finite sum because it's a polynomial of degree i plus j. And these would be the structure constants of the algebra. Which is the basic thing you do if you have any kind of an algebra, the algebra, whatever, and a basis, then if you want, you can write the thing in terms of the base, and then the multiplication becomes a collection of structure constants. Now, here we already know that this is, you know, k is less than or equal to i plus j, so I can write it as i plus j minus something. And also because of the same, remember that in my case, if I do this for Bernoulli numbers, so now let me not be so general, because there's no reason. So these are Bernoulli polynomials, right? not Bernoulli numbers. 
I can certainly write the product of any two Bernoulli polynomials as a linear combination of Bernoulli polynomials, and those are the structure constants for this different base. Now, uh, this k has to be at most i plus j, uh, you know, minus something, and I claim that something has to be even. And that's, again, because if I shift by half, which doesn't, you know, it's still true, this identity with x replaced by x plus half, then the even bi's are even functions, and the odd ones are odd, and so their product is even or odd depending on the parity of i plus j. So k has to have the same parity, should be congruent to i plus j. And now the amazing thing is when you do this, you can compute a table of these, let's say, for all i and j and k up to you know, 20. And what you find is that this is always, so let me take a nice example. Let me take 12. This is always divisible. Well, of course, all rational numbers are divisible. But at the beginning, they're very simple rational numbers with small numerators and dominators. I claim it's always divisible by 691. So the top coefficient, of course, c i j i plus j is naturally 1. Uh, i plus j is naturally 1. It's got to be, because these are monic polynomials. If I multiply x to the i times x to the j, it starts x to the i plus j. The next one down, b i plus j minus 2, you can do by hand. The next one you can do by hand. You can even do 12 by hand if you have a lot of hands or a lot of time. It would take you an afternoon to write it out. But you won't see this because it's a sum of a whole bunch of terms. But that sum of numbers will always be divisible by 691. And remember that 691 is the famous prime that every number theorist knows well, uh, which is the numerator. It's the first prime that occurs non trivially in the Bernoulli numbers of Bn over n. I guess there's a minus sign. So it's the numerator of B12. This is a story I like to tell anecdotes. I told the one about Sarah. I'll have another one about myself and Sloan soon. Uh, this is one about, as I told the one about Gelfand. Uh, here's one about Sarah. I can't vouch for it. I know Sarah very well, but he's never told me this. But I've heard it from other people. Many years ago, some young mathematician who came to Sarah, and he said, you know, I would, I would uh, like to, I think number theory is such a, Beautiful, you know, I like number theory so much. Could I become your student and, and uh, your PhD student? So Sarah gave him a one line test. It was very quick. He said, What's 691? The guy looked completely blank. I don't know. I can't. It's a prime. It's not this by 2, 3, 7, or 13. And Sarah said, Go away. You're not actually interested in number theory. It's a beautiful answer. And amazingly, if you're not a number theorist, you'll think it's just a put down. But if you are a number theorist, like, Ken Ono, you know, his, his email address uh, has a 691. My passwords, I mean, they have other things, so it doesn't help you, but there's always a 691 somewhere. Number theorists just love 691. It's this really sexy prime. It's the first irregular prime, not the smallest, but the first one that occurs. Every number theorist knows it. And it's kind of true if you've read all, you know, class field theory and so on, you think you know number theory, but you've never heard of 691. It means you aren't actually interested in numbers. Anyway, according to the story, Sarah said, go away study something else. You don't really like number theory. So this is the statement. In other words, in general, I'm claiming that uh, b i j minus 2 l is divisible, whatever it means. Every rational number is divisible by any other rational number if it's not 0. But it's sort of naturally divisible by b 2 l. So that's the cute discovery. And I'm not going to give the proof. It's only, well, no, I, I will give the, the essence of the proof because there's a cute property in it, too. So, so it is kind of fun, and maybe I will give it. I'm digressing a lot. Maybe I'll never even finish them, but I'm supposed to do in this lecture, and then I'll do it next time. But nobody's keeping track of it. But this one I didn't write down in my notes because the form is too long. So here's the theorem. Let me write, just for convenience, yet a third notation. I excuse. So B and bar was BN made per periodic. Let me ignore the, remember B0 is this kind of stupid polynomial, it's the constant one. Let me renormalize the Bernoulli numbers by dividing by n. It just makes every form I'm about to write uh, more uh, attractive. Then the proposition, which I said is due to Nielsen, but it's in this appendix of mine. So if I multiply two of them, I want the structure constants. Then it's the sum, well, as I already told you, it has to be uh, b i plus j minus 2 l of x. And so l has to be at most i plus j over 2. But let me do that case separately. So let me take first the terms, which are not the constant part, 
Okay, so I write this as a combination of binary polynomials. We already know by parity that it has to be i plus j minus 12, but there will still be a multiple of the constant polynomial, so there'll be a constant, which I'll write separately in a second. Okay, so now the question is, what's the coefficient of this? Sorry, this is script B again. And this is also script, well, this was script B, just not very well written. And the answer is rather nice, not quite as nice as it might be, but nicer than it might not have been, so to speak. So I'm writing 2L, like physicists would do, but it's the wrong way. I should write L is between 0, it's less than or equal, or greater than or equal to 0, less than i plus j, and put i plus j minus L, but L always has to be even. So it means that everywhere it's really L, but I have to write 2L because it's better to write just even numbers, not call them over 2L. So you have an odd combination of 1 over i times the binomial coefficient i over 2L plus 1 over j. And that's the coefficient, except, as I warned you, here you still have to be there going over. So that's what I told that the coefficient in that structure comes c, i, j, and then upstairs, i plus j minus 2L. It's a multiple, a simple multiple. Well, this is just a sum binomial coefficient, but this is a highly non-trivial number, with like 691. And then there's still a constant term. And the constant term is just the Bernoulli number, b i plus j multiplied by some, uh, it's basically, a, it's like a reciprocal binomial coefficient again. Okay, so that's the formula. And let me give the proof sketch. Let b i j of x, I just define script b i j, to be this first term. I don't care about the constant. You'll see why in a second. I'm going to determine this up to a constant. So the proof will have two parts. I want to show that this thing is equal to the product b i b j up to a constant. And then this form is true up to a constant. Then I have to find the constant, which is completely different. You know, this doesn't look like that. So uh, let b i j equal this uh, the colon equals. So it's this right. It's this first term. Then use either that Bn, so the property of Bernoulli numbers, remember, Bernoulli polynomials is that the difference at x plus 1 and x was n x to the n minus 1. But now it's even nicer because I've divided by n. Or uh, you can equivalently use Bn prime of x is n Bn minus 1 of x. Sorry, n minus 1 because I divided by n. So as an exercise, I'm going to give the proof using this, but you can also use this and prove the same. What I'm trying to prove is that this expression, bij, differs from the product bibj by a constant. So there are two ways to show that two polynomials are equal up to a constant. The obvious one that's true for any real functions is you differentiate them both. If the derivatives are the same, they differ by constant. But the other is if the difference is periodic. A periodic polynomial is also constant. And so here I'm going to use the periodicity one because it's more fun. So let's compute now. I'm not going to do it in detail. B i j of, I just look at what happens when you replace x by x plus 1. Then you get sum of the same L as before in this sum, 1 over i times i 2 L plus 1 over j times j 2 L. But now in this thing, what happens in here, oh, here, when you replace x by x plus 1 and subtract, you'll just get x to the power uh, i plus j minus 2l minus 1. Okay? But that is just a combination of bi of x and bj of x. But I'm going to be a little tricky because there's still a term i, uh, i plus j minus 2, and I'm going to split it into twice half of itself. So if you bought this out, it takes one minute. You just expand this by the binomial theorem. Then what you'll find is bj of x times uh, plus a half x to the i minus 1. But I claim that that's kind of obviously the difference bi of x plus 1 minus b, uh, times bj of x plus 1 
minus bi of x. I hope you can still see this down here. If not, I'll have to copy it at the top of the board. If you multiply b two polynomials, f times g, at x plus 1, bi of x plus 1 is bi of x plus a monomial. And bj of x plus 1 is bj of x plus a monomial. So when I multiply, there are four terms, bi of x times bj of x, and I'm subtracting it. Then x to the i, some, some power of x times bi, some complementary power times bj, and then a constant in i plus j, which is i plus j minus 2. I've split it in this nice way. So it has this property. And so what I've shown is that the difference of this is exactly the same as the difference at x plus 1 and x of bi and bj. And therefore, they differ by constant. And you can also do it, it's an exercise, differentiate bi prime bj prime. It's an easy computation. You'll also get the, you know, the same as the derivative of the left-hand side. So now it's true up to a constant, but the constant is now easy because now I just integrate this over the unit circle. This one we already did. These all give 0. And this gives what it is, and that's the answer I had before. So the hard part of this, which is the constant term, is exactly the lemma we had before of the uh, integral of the product of two Bernoulli polynomials. So this was an extremely long answer to a very innocent question. Are the Bernoulli polynomials orthogonal? Whose answer is one two-letter word, no. And I spent a lot of time on that no. Like the famous put down, what part of the word no is it that you don't understand when somebody asks you for a favor and you say no? So that's my, well, at least I've done both. I had two digressions, one with the orthogonal polynomials and one with nice properties of Bernoulli polynomials, the Fourier expansion, which is really important, uh, the corollary, which was the integral formula for BR bar times BS bar, even with shifts, and this very nice formula for the structure constants of the ring. OK, well, now I've used up one hour out of my one and a half not to start today's lecture. Well, at least what was supposed to be today's lecture. So today's lecture had two halves. One was the part I didn't get to of last time's lecture. And then I was starting on a new theme. So that's actually very nice, because now I can finish the story of last time. And then uh, next time I'll start. So next week, Tuesday and Thursday, I'll start with the extrapolation trick. And that's the thing that one can use all the time in practical problems to end as many variants that are very nice to know about. So now let me go back to my actual story. Uh, so last time, so now the, the, the course now resumes. Last time, we showed if f of t is some function which is at the first, it's asymptotic at the origin to some b n t to the n. There were many variants where you could have log singularities and, and powers. But let's say it's just some smooth function at 0. It's small at infinity, small enough that I can make the sum m from 1 to infinity, f of mt. So if f is a nice function which has such an expansion as t goes to 0, then in the simplest version, uh, g of t had an expansion which had what I called, just to make it easy to remember, the Riemann term, i f is the integral from 0 to infinity f of x dx. So it's the integral divided by t. That would be the Riemann integral approximation to the infinite sum. And the other part is the formal thing you would get just by uh, just substitute one series in the other and pretend you can do what you please. And then you find that the dot coefficient b n t to the n turns into b n z of minus n t to the n. So this was the thing we had proved uh, using Euler McMorn. And I won't give four examples. Two I said already last time. Maybe I even gave them. But I'll do it very quickly again, just for completeness. Uh, that's just you know, a reality check that we haven't gone crazy. So if I take f of t to be pure exponential, e to the minus lambda t, then of course g of t is the sum e to the minus m lambda t, which is a geometric series. It's simply e to the power lambda t minus 1. And this we already saw last time. It's an easy, well, no, sorry, that's the definition of the Bernoulli numbers. We got the sum n from 0 to infinity, lambda n t to the n, b n plus 1 over n plus 1 factor. Well, that's the, simply the definition of Bernoulli numbers. So, but here, of course, and here I can remind you that this can also be written as minus 1 to the n times the nth Bernoulli number divided, uh, n plus first, divided by n plus 1. 
So here you see that, of course, the expansion of this is just, you know, an order found when you define the exponential function, it's minus lambda to the n over t to the n. And so the minus 1 to the n and it goes away with this. The lambda to the n is sitting here. The bn plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial is so not over t to the n over n factorial. The n plus 1 and the n factorial give you an n plus 1 factorial. And you see it works just like it should. Of course, that's the trivial example that we used to, to make the whole thing work, but just to make sure nothing has gotten lost. Then another example I mentioned briefly last time, but since the question has come up a couple of times, what happens if I take f of t to be e to the minus lambda t squared? So now, bn, well, first of all, I didn't say what i was. Of course, here, i, well, it's, it's what it has to be to make this work. Here, i, f is the square root of pi over lambda. I famous in uh, all the gals did. So f of t is e to the minus lambda squared. So here, that means that bn, it's an even function, so it's 0 if n is odd. And if n is 2k, then, of course, it's minus lambda to the k over k factorial. So we know exactly what the bn's are. And so what is the gn? Well, the gn, that's where we use the property of the theta function. So here, g of t is the sum, m from 1 to infinity, of e to the minus lambda, well, m lambda m squared t, m squared lambda t. But the right way to write that is if m were 0, this would be 1. I want to subtract that. So it's the sum over all m in z. If every m is either positive, negative, or 0, if it's positive or negative, you get the positive ones twice because this is even, so you get that. And the constant term must subtract it off. But now, by the Poisson summation form, which I uh, gave and which Basically, you're kind of supposed to know, but in case you don't, I, I wrote it down last time. If you have any nice function here, a Gaussian, so a very nice function, and you sum it over the lattice, it's the same as the sum of the same lattice of the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform by the same integral that Gauss did that gave the square root of pi, you can compute. So we know that this thing, if you replace t by 1 over t, then... Well, actually, you have to, if with pi, for minus pi m squared t, well, it doesn't matter which order. If it were pi times m squared t, you would replace t by 1 over t. Now you replace lambda t by 1 over lambda t. So it means it's actually e to the minus, uh, I think it's pi squared over lambda, over lambda t inverse times m squared. But it doesn't matter if I got it right or wrong, because whatever number, I think it is minus pi squared over lambda t. But it's something positive. Uh, over t, and so an exponential e to the minus something over t is, of course, small to all conceivable orders. So this is Poisson summation, and therefore here, well, I'll write it back at the top because I'm running out of space, uh, I get one term. If m is 0, that's 1, so it's 1 over 2 squared of t. Then the next term is the constant term, which the g didn't have, and then it's plus o of t to the n for all n. So in other words, this is a very, very simple the uh, Laurent series, it's a terminating Laurent series. It has its pole term. It has, uh, well, in, in square root of t here, uh, uh, sorry, uh, did I do it correctly? Uh, 1 over t square root of t, that's right. So it's not quite a pole term, it's a Laurent series in square root of t. It has the negative power, t to the minus half, this comes, but it has no more terms. But that, of course, that we know because of the Poisson summation form. But now we check this, and you see that here, all that I really care about is that bn is 0 if n is odd, and b0 is 1. But now in this sum, if n is odd, this product is 0 because bn is 0. But if n is even, this product is always 0 because z of minus 2, z of minus 4, z of minus 6 all vanish. The equivalent of the odd day of the experimental numbers vanish, except for b1 and except for z of 0. And so this is just b0. So you see that this is equal to i f over t plus b0. Uh, sorry, it's not uh, z of 0 is minus a half. So it's minus a half beta 0 plus o of t to the all n for all n if uh, b n, if, b, if the odd index ones are 0. So we just get a confirmation of what we already knew from the Poisson summation. As I explained last time, this special case, you can get, see in general also without doing this, just from Poisson summation, if the function is, 
uh, is odd uh, as a power series, then if I just define it by reflection, then it's still C infinity at the origin. It may not be analytic, but it will be C infinity because all the odd terms vanish. And it's small at infinity, so I apply Poisson to that, and I get my expansion, and, and everything is zero. So, so uh, and the sum over half the lattice is half the sum over the whole lattice. So that's the, the two basic, you know, the trivial case of Euler McLaurin, which is the exponential function, which is why the Bernoulli numbers have to come in. But it also tells you this trivial example tells you that if you knew that there is such a theorem with some multiple, I mean, you didn't know that it's eight of minus n, you didn't know that it's this, it's just something, then this example tells you it has to be bn plus one. Because, uh, okay, so those are the two boring examples. And now I want to give two non-trivial examples. I hope I can finish them both today. And then start on a new theme next time. Okay, so the first example is, so example three. I'm going to avoid the two. You can do this for one, two, but there's an extra argument. I'll, leave, I'll say at the end, leave it as an exercise. So if k is an inch are different from two, I define function g k of q Uh, so here Q will be, let's say, a real number between there and well, I don't even care that it's uh, real, they're just a complex number, absolute value. And here I put the sum of the K minus first powers of the divisors of N as a coefficient, and so that's my power series. So this is a power series. In Q, a formal power series, but it converges, of course, if Q is less than 1, because the coefficient is at most polynomial, has polynomial growth, and the Q to the n is exponentially small. So that's the definition. And now the question is, what is the asymptotics of that as you tend to 0? But let me first give you the proof why it is because of modularity. Okay? So if K is even and not equal to 2, 2 is a little different, and we'll do it at the end. Then we have the following. I define the function gk of tau. So tau is now going to be a multiple form. Uh, not a multiple, this is going to be a multiple form. Tau will be in the upper half plane, which means complex numbers of a strictly positive real part. And q, as always in that world, is e to the 2 pi i tau. I'm not going to use anything about multiple forms except just for the form I'm about to write, which I wrote last time. gk of tau is defined. There's a certain multiple, I think I'll put it, but I may get it wrong, uh, 2 pi i to the k, but this might be the wrong constant. But anyway, there's a constant depending on k, and then it's the sum, as I wrote last time, over all integers m and n, except 0, 0, so all non-zero -lat non lattice points in C2, of 1 over m tau plus n to the, sorry, not to the k minus 1 to the k. And this has the property of being multiple form, and I wrote down last time what it means, g of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is c tau plus d to the k times gk of tau. I don't really care about that except that that's the basic property that people know and that's absolutely standard. And the Fourier expansion of gk is also very standard. The constant term is the Bernoulli number, the kth Bernoulli number divided by 2k. Remember, k is even, so that's non-zero. And the rest is exactly g, uh, this gk, uh, gk of q. So in other words, the Fourier expansion there's a constant term, which is a denominator uh, in general, actually, always. And then the other terms are integers, and ex they're exactly the sum. And I gave that formula last time. But the point is that this is modular. So gk is modular. Remember, that means that a tau plus b over c tau plus d. I just said it. I'll write it out to remind you. c tau plus d to the k gk of tau. So in particular, if I take the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0, Minus 1 over tau is still in the upper half plane. Then I'll get tau to the k, gk of tau, which means that if I take gk of it, inverse, so if t is positive, and I take tau to be it, so on the imaginary axis, then I'll get here minus 1 to the k over t to the k times gk of i times t. 
So that's a fact that we're, I'm going to use, but to, to prove the asymptotics, I won't use, we'll use our general formula. But I'm showing that here we reproduce something that's known if k is 4, 6, or 8, but not if it's uh, 2. Or, well, 2 is more or less works, but not if it's odd. So here I have this uh, thing because of the multidarity. So now I am using the multidarity. And uh, so I have this. But then that means I should have put it on the other side. Maybe I'll do that right now. Actually, I did it wrong anyway. The t to the k, the 1 over t to the k is exactly if I put it. So I actually got it wrong. The, the negative power uh, is when you put it and here i over t. So we have this property. But now what does that mean? This, this thing here is the constant term bk over 2k, which, by the way, is simply 1 half zeta of 1 minus k, I don't care about that. It's, well, it is, OK, it's 1 half zeta of 1 minus k uh, plus, and then the rest is gk of tau, but that's e to the 2 pi tau q. It's e to the 2 pi tau, so it's e to the minus 2 pi t. And on the right, I'll have minus 1 to the k over 2, which is plus or minus 1, because k over 2 is an integer, over t to the k. But now gk will be its constant term, which is, again, uh, minus bk over 2k, to all orders. So that means plus o of t to the n for every n, because again, this, this thing has a Fourier expansion as a constant term, but everything else is exponentially small. It's e to the 2 pi tau, but tau is now 1 over t, so it's e to minus some constant over t. It's smaller than any power of t. So this tells you the asymptotic expansion. So let me write what I've just proved. So, but using multilinearity, we know that e to the minus 2 pi t is equal because of what I just wrote. There are two terms. There's minus 1 to the k over 2 minus 1 times the k Bernoulli number over 2k times t to the minus k. If I didn't get the sign right. And then it's plus b2k over uh, bk over 2k. And it's plus o of t to the n for all n. So here we know the answer. And of course, if you don't know, I mean, if you didn't know this thing was multiple, we'd have no reason to call the e to the minus 2 pi t. So I should really call this e to the minus t, and then it would have to just be t over 2 pi to the k. And that wouldn't change. So now I want to show you that that's the example, that we can get this. And that's where in my talk that many of you were at on the Ramanujan day on Monday, I mentioned that uh, Hardy somewhere has written that one couldn't expect to get any of these formulas if one didn't know multidarity. But I'm going to show you here in the later lectures that in many cases, this uh, euler maclaurin with the shifted euler maclaurin is good enough to get the asymptotics. Of course, it's weaker than multidarity, but it doesn't, it's much more elementary. So this is our goal. So now how do we do this? Well, I simply define f of tau. Uh, Wait, now I suddenly panic. Oh, here it is. I define f of tau be t to the k minus 1 divided by e to the t minus 1. So it's the usual expansion. If this were t over e to the t, t, t minus 1, this would simply be the usual expansion of the generating function, the Bernoulli numbers, with t to the r. And so here I'll just multiply that by t to the k minus 2. So this is, of course, this is not an equality because this diverges, but it's an asymptotic expansion all orders. OK, but if you look what this is, this is so let's maybe I should have started in, in order. GK of u is the sum n from 1 to infinity. Look at the definition. It's the sum sigma k minus 1 of n, which is the sum n is dm. But if n is dm, that means that n is d times m, where d and m are both integers. And now they're independent integers, right? Because every positive number, together with the positive divisor, is equivalent to two positive numbers, d and m, and n is their product. So here, I have d to the k minus 1. And here, I have q to the and m, uh, md. 
But you see that the sum Q to the MD, M from 1 to infinity, is just a geometric series. It's simply Q to the D over 1 minus Q to the D. So therefore, if I take GK of e to the minus tau, as I say, now e to the minus t, there's no reason here to call it uh, 2 pi t. It's just a name. GK of t, but if I multiply it by t to the k minus 1, it looks crazy, but you'll see very quickly why I have to do that. Because now, the d to the k minus 1 multiplied by uh, t to the k minus 1 is dt to the k minus 1. And then the next part is e to the minus dt over 1 minus e to the minus dt, so it's e to the dt minus 1. And so this is the g of t of our general theorem. If f is this function, then the sum f of nt, which now I'm calling f of dt, is indeed the sum dt to the k minus 1 over e to the dt minus 1. So now I'm exactly set up to use our, our thing. So I have to compute if. If is the sum n from 1 to infinity. Well, it's the integral from 0 to infinity. And then t to the k minus 1, e to the minus nt dt. But the integral t to the k minus 1, e to the minus t dt, well, the definition of the gamma function is k, k minus 1 factorial. And here it's over n to the k. And so we know exactly what that integral is. It's just k minus 1 factorial times the Riemann zeta function at k. So now, by our general theorem, we know that this is the expansion to all orders, all orders. The thing that I just wrote, so that's k minus 1 factorial zeta of k times 1 over t, plus, and now I have to take the expansion of this, and now you see that's why I didn't want k to be either 2 or 1 or something too small. k is at least 4. So if k is at least 4, then k minus 2 is at least 2, r is at least 0. So this is at least 2. And Bernoulli numbers that are at least 2 are always even. So for what it's worth, but in particular, they're, they're non-zero. So I can apply the general uh, algorithm, and the general algorithm says that I have to multiply t to the n by 2 minus r minus k, t to the uh, r plus k minus 2. But now if you look at this sum, k is even, because I chose k to be even. r is always even, except if r is 2, but so except if r is 1, r has to be even because all other Bernoulli numbers are 0. So therefore, this is always an, uh, r is even, k is even, and this is strictly negative even, and so z is 0. So therefore, this whole thing, only one term survives, which is the term r equals 1. For r equals 1, we have b1, which is minus a half. Here I have z of 1 minus k, and here it's t to the k minus 1. And so you see exactly the two terms. If you put in the Bernoulli number, those are the two terms we saw for modularity, a term 1 over t to the k. And you have to rescale and put in some two pi's. So here you see that we don't need modularity. To, modularity tells us, in particular, by weakening in the law, it tells us that the expansion of the function, as tau goes to 0, or as q tends to 1 in the unit circle, so q tends to 1 is the same as tau tends to 0, then that expansion by multilinearity is the same as at infinity. But infinity, everything is, except the constant, everything's exponentially small, or the leading term for any multiple form. So for any multiple form, you have the full expansion at 1. And what's more, you also have the full expansion at minus 1, and at uh, uh, you know, e to the 2 pi i over 3, and at i, and at all roots of unity, because they correspond to rational points here, like you know, a third and a half, and so on. So. Uh, because of modularity, you know all of those things. So if you have a multiple form, you have the expansion as q tends to any cusp. But if you don't have, but it's given in a nice form, you may have that expansion anyway using this Euler-Maclaurin, where you would use the untwisted one here with the Bernoulli numbers, but the twisted one with Bernoulli polynomials at other rational points. Well, that's completely a waste of time if the function is rational, is, is multiple. But now let's first of all look what happens if k is 2. Well, if k is 2, I'm not going to write it out. But g2, it's well known, it's not, does not satisfy this, but it almost does. Well, I will write it out. Maybe g2 of minus 1 over tau is tau squared g2 of tau plus a constant, which I won't try to say because I'm used to different normalization. It's some constant. It's uh, 6 over pi in the other normalization. It's, I don't know what it is. Uh, 
so there's a slight hiccup. It's what's called a quasi multiform form that we just heard a lecture by Georg Oberdijk a few minutes ago, if you were there. Uh, so it isn't quite true. And in particular, when I do the asymptotics, again, as t goes to 0, then 1 over t goes to infinity. I mean, this is dominated just by one term. So it's the same expansion as before, but there's one extra term. And here you see that if k is 2, then there's one extra term. Because I still have the term if r is 1. There's the wrong parity. But I also have the term if r is 0. That is even. b0 is not 0. But if k is 2, I have t to the 0. And it's, it's the only one that, that still works, that you, you don't get into trouble with you know, product of Bernoulli numbers. So you also get the quasi multilayer or the, the same expansion for g2. But where it's really fun is when you take k to be odd. So if you take k to be odd, let's take g3 of e to the minus t. Well, the method, that's not multilayer at all. So we absolutely can't use the previous method. But you do the same thing. So this is an exercise, just a straightforward computation. The calculation of the uh, integral is the same as before. It's always k minus 1 factorial. So here, 2 factorial times 8 of k over t to the k. And then if you just do it, you'll get the following expansion. There's a, a pole term. There's a t cubed term, but another pole term. It's an odd expansion. It's an infinite expansion because there is no modularity. Because what happens, well, in general, uh, what you'll find for any k, even or odd, well, in fact, I already wrote it, but I think I just erased it, so I'll write it again. gk of e to the minus t will always be, to all orders, k minus 1 factorial z of k divided by t to the k plus the sum from 0 to infinity I mean, I might get, if I now put in the zeta values in terms of Bernoulli numbers, and if I don't get anything wrong, it's this formula. So this is a completely unit. It's the same proof I just gave. It absolutely doesn't care if k is even or odd. Even the k is 1 is not quite allowed. There's a log. You have to use the thing I did last time about if there's a log singularity in f. But now you see that if k is even, then k minus 1 is odd. These are Bernoulli numbers of opposite parity. So they're always 0 unless one of them is b1, which happens twice for g2 and that constant term. But if k is even, if it's odd, then these are the same parity. And so you get a product of two Bernoulli numbers. Now, the r factorial will help for convergence. But br blows up like, like r factorial. So this is just exponential growth. But here, there's another br, so it's factorially divergent. So this is always a divergent asymptotic function, but it is the full asymptotic expansion of this function. This function is completely well-defined. This thing is absolutely convergent because q, which is e to the minus t, is less than 1. So that's a nice example that you see that if it's multilinear, you get a confirmation, but you know it almost all the terms disappear. But if it's not multilinear, you see that because the terms don't disappear, but they're still completely explicit. They're rational numbers, and you get the asymptotics to all orders. By the way, this asymptotics is used. Uh, I invented a word, not really any theorems, about 10 years ago, partly in Trist, called quantum multilinear forms. And now I have a more refined version of that called quantum holomorphic multilinear forms that I've talked about once or twice in Trieste. And there are functions which aren't modular, but they have the property that the difference between f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d and what it should be is not zero, but it extends holomorphically over part of the real line. And then the odd weight Eisenstein series, exactly these functions have that property and that's uh, quite related to these asymptotic expansions. So there's, you know, there's more going on than to this than just asymptotics and products of Bernoulli numbers. OK, well, I have now two minutes left. And that's too little for the last example. But I'll do, do it anyway, half of it. And then I'll pr pr promise you that I come back to it in a later lecture uh, when I talk about, maybe I'll do it at the beginning of next time. So let me just do it very briefly. Let me take, so that's the last example. Let me take f of t this time to be minus log of 1 minus e to the minus t. So that I gave the expansion last time, because if you differentiate this, you again get 1 over e to the t minus 1. And so we know the expansion. So this has a, a, you know, a standard expansion, uh, which, well, maybe I will write it out. It's 
log of 1 over t, I hope I'm not making any mistakes, minus the sum n from 1 to infinity, and then it's the usual bn over n factorial, but now also n times n factorial, t to the n. So that's the expansion, if I got the signs wrong, right, that we had last time. So this is asymptotic to all orders. And so g of t, by the, uh, the general theorem, which I, I explained last time, you can also allow log singularities. Then the first, the full form will be there's a 1 over t term, which is the integral. And you get the integral by the same method I used before. It's eight of 2. Then this was a general thing for anything with the log. You always got log of t over 2 pi. And then the other terms, you do what you always do. So it's minus 1 to the n, bn over n times n factorial, times bn plus 1 over n plus 1, times t to the n. That's by the general theorem. But then again, this whole thing is simply, and I'm not sure if the sign, so it's either with or without the minus sign. I think it's the sum is simply 1 uh, times t. Because if n is 1, I'd be 1 and b 2. And they're both non-zero. But if n is anything else, they have uh, n and n plus 1 of opposite parities. One of the two Bernoulli numbers will always vanish. So here I again get determinating expansion. So I know what g of t is. But what is g of t? Well, g of t is the sum. That's well, how we always defined it of uh, f of mt. So that's the negative log. So it's the log of 1 over the product m from 1 to infinity of 1 minus e to the minus mt. Here, if I took uh, uh, 2 pi t dead, then this would be exactly log of, well, it's essentially the dedicate data function. So it's q to the 1 24th over, well, tau over 2 pi i, tau over. I can't do this in my head. Yeah, and it is tau over 2 pi i, probably. No, I give up. I'll go back to what I said, 2 pi t, so with the real number, and then it will be 8 of i tau. So in this case, uh, this is essentially the log of the eta function that I spoke about briefly in the uh, last time or in a previous lecture. And that has modularity properties. And therefore, the modularity properties here says that i of eta over t is the square root of t times a, uh, i times t, which is therefore equal to square root of t. Eta starts with q to the 1 24th. So here I have a, a pi t over 12 to all orders. So again, because of the modularity, you know the expansion of this to all orders. There's a single exponential. When I take the log, this exponential becomes, sorry, this is not t, it's uh, 1 over t. So it's minus pi over 12 t. So if I take the log, I'll get a 1 over t term a one-half log t, which you see here, and everything else. And so the modularity would imply this. But here you have a nice example where, again, we don't use modularity. And the final example was going to be, but I'll leave that as an exercise. So exercise, and I'll, next time people can say if, if anyone uh, succeeded in doing it, we define pq of t as the McMahon function, the same McMahon that came up in connection with Ramanujan and they did the computation of p of 200, the McMahon function, which was later realized to have a beautiful property, it's a generating function, uh, and it counts plane partitions rather than ordinary partitions. I'm not going to say now what they are. If you take 1 minus q to the n to the n, that's not modular at all. But you can do the same thing. And so the question is, uh, so the exercise is, what is the asymptotics as q tends to 1? And the nice way to do it is put q as always as e to the minus 2 pi i. And the question is, what is the answer as t tends to 0? So can you describe that in using this asymptotic? Of course, you take the log, because it's a product and we need the sum. And then you just do the thing. And just as with here, you'll find that you again have two Bernoulli numbers, but they're no longer shifted by 1. They're shifted by 2. And so now you get an infinite power series expansion. It's non-trivial. Non I mean, it, it doesn't terminate. But it's completely explicit. It gives you the answer. So that's a collection. And this, in connection with the circle method that I'll come to in probably two weeks, is the way that will allow us to find information, just like they did for partitions, about the number of plane partitions from this method. I'll do that case. I'll do a similar case. OK, so that's all for now. And I only got three minutes over time. It's not so bad. If there are questions, feel free to ask. You can also come afterwards. Ah. 
What about Eisenstein series of half integer weight? Can one do a similar analysis? But no, that has nothing to do with this at all. So you could first, I don't know if you could all hear, yes, about Eisenstein series of half integer weights. It sounds like they're very related. I, Eisenstein series of integer weights, but actually they're completely different. So the Eisenstein series of integer weight is this thing, where k is an integer. Well, it should be even and bigger than 2, let's say. And then this one up to a constant and so on is, has an expansion, sigma 1 minus nq to the n. Now, if k is a half integral, uh, you know, n plus a half, this series still converts, but it doesn't quite converge for three halves, but it's, uh, but anyway, for bigger weights, there is an Eisenstein series. It's a perfectly good multiple form, but it's Fourier expansion, for instance, for three halves, it doesn't quite converge, but you can do a convergence trick. I did that 30 years ago, and it was one of the first examples of what we now know as a multiple form. The coefficients, the nth coefficient of that, so the Eisenstein series of weight three halves, has a Fourier expansion, and roughly the nth coefficient is a class number. And similarly, if you take five halves, it's a value of, say, class number is also the value of an L series, the Dirichlet L series, at s equals one or s equals zero of the function equation. If you take g5 halves, you have values of L series at s equals 2 or s equals minus 1. They're deep number theoretical functions. They aren't trivial sums. This was just a divisor sum. So although it looks like it's the same object because it's, it's still a multiple form, that part doesn't change. But the Fourier expansion is completely of a different form. So this is, has absolutely no relevance to that. Those things don't fit this, and they're way harder. I mean, to know the asymptotics, you have to use, again, the circle method. But uh, you get information about the asymptotics of H of n, but it's of a different nature. So uh, the same, by the way, happens if you look at higher, like zero, Eisenstein series. If you look at them, it depends a little on whether the genus is even or odd. Sometimes you get something like class numbers. So on SP4, uh, the next case of Siegel multiforms, you get class numbers. But the next one, SP6, which is very interesting. Then you again get divisor sums connected with the quaternion algebra. So which kind of number you get, whether the coefficients are an elementary arithmetic function like this or a highly non-elementary function like class numbers depends on the parity and here, therefore, on integer, half integer. So the answer is they don't fit this story at all. And they're both wonderful functions, and I, I love them, but they don't fit with on the Maclaurin. If you have more questions, ask me privately or at the beginning of next time. So, okay. So, actually, one or two. Oh, you had a question. I, I couldn't find you, but because you took the mic, and then you you went off to take bring the mic to somebody. So, so did you want to ask now?